Okay, so I'd like to thank Sarah very much for the invitation to, to give a talk at this Anne McLaren Symposium. It's a, great, it's a great privilege indeed. And I'm going to tell you about work we've been doing towards refining procedures to prevent transmission of mitochondrial DNA disease. But before I, I move on, I would very much like to acknowledge the hard work, foresight, and indeed bravery of Anne, who together with Mary Warnock set the framework for regulation of, of research with human embryos in the UK and made, made the work I'm about to speak about possible. So we inherit our mitochondrial genomes from our mothers and the human fertilized egg contains, is estimated to contain about 300,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA is very small. It just encodes 37 genes, 13 polypeptides, all of which are involved in, in production of, of ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. Now, if a woman carries mutations in her mitochondrial genome, she's at risk of transmitting serious disease to her children. Uh, and pathogenic mutations in mitochondrial DNA cause a broad spectrum of multi-system diseases they're estimated to affect about one in 5,000 of the population. And disease onset can occur in childhood or later life. And in the worst cases, children will die in the first years of life. And, and there is yet uh, no curative treatments. So inheritance of mitochondrial DNA disease is complicated by the fact that for most path pathogenic mutations, they coexist with wild type mitochondrial DNA. And it's the severity of, this, of disease symptoms is determined by the relative levels of mutated to wild type. And, and, and from our perspective, very importantly, women who carry mitochondrial DNA mutations produce eggs with widely varying mutation loads. And this makes it very difficult to predict the risk of disease transmission. So these women are stuck in this situation where they may have a child who's, who's, who's unaffected or a child who has serious disease and there's no way of knowing. So, so then the question arose of whether IVF-based approaches can be used to help to help trans to help prevent the risk of transmission. And so one thing we can offer in a couple of centers throughout Europe, including ours are offering at the moment, is to do PGD. Now, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is, is conventionally used to detect mutations in the nuclear genome, but we can also apply it to, to, to take cells from the, from the embryo and test them. And this enables us to to, to identify embryos with the lowest mutation loads and they can be used for replacement. But it's not suitable in all cases and about 20% of women that we see through com coming through for PGD do not produce embryos with, with sufficiently low mutation loads to be below the, the disease threshold. So the concept of mitochondrial DNA replacement really arose from the need uh, to, 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 to develop approaches to, to help these women. Um, so, so the concept really is to, is to rescue the nuclear genome from its defective mitochondrial environment. And that means transplanting the nuclear genome and can in principle be done before the egg is fertilized by transplanting the spindle and, and, and the chromosomes here. And there are a couple of groups in the US working on that. Or we can also wait until after the egg is fertilized. And this is the benefit indeed of being able to see what you're doing by light microscopy. And this is the approach that we, we've been taking and this is what I'll be talking about. Um, so in the context of clinical treatment, we would collect eggs from a patient and from an unaffected donor. Um, and we fertilize both of those sets of eggs. We allow the pronuclei to develop and then we remove the pronuclei from both. So here we have a patient carrioplast the carrioplast consists of the pronuclei surrounded by some cytoplasm, which, which almost inevitably contains some mitochondria and therefore some mitochondrial DNA. And then we have the enucleated donor, donor zygote and the fusion of, the two, of both of these, of the carrioplast and the enucleated donor zygote gives us 
a, a reconstructed embryo which predominantly contains the mitochondrial DNA for the, from the unaffected donor and the nuclear DNA from the patient and her partner. Um, so we, 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 we have been, just to give you a quick, a brief run through the history of this. So chronicular transfer was first performed in the mouse in 1983 in Dabur Salter's lab. Um, and then there was some lovely work thereafter from Lauren Smith's lab, um, looking at using the system to look at segregation of mitochondrial DNA during pre-implantation development in the mouse. And then we asked whether it was technically feasible to do this in the human, and that proof of concept work was published in 2010. And then in 2016, we published a sort of preclinical work in which we tested the, the, the safety and efficacy based on just in vitro development of blastocyst and on development of ES cells following, following pronuclear transfer. And then there was the very important work done by the uh, HFEA expert panel of which Robin was a member and the work they did and uh, is, is very nicely summarized in a paper in Nature Biotechnology. And that really, um, they examined the scientific evidence uh, and then really set, gave, gave great, great uh, um, guidance to the regulators and indeed the legislators. And then in, in 2017, we were awarded a license here at Newcastle Fertility Center to use these previously non-permitted embryos to go back to Sarah's talk. <clears throat> um, so our clinic, this is just a brief word about clinical treatment before I get onto our research. We're current, the clinical study is currently underway. And for each case that we see, we need HFEA approval for each individual case. And this new treatment is offered only to those for whom PGD is unlikely to work. And the NHS funded treatment is on condition of follow ups of children being included in follow up studies. And patients are informed that pronuclear transfer is likely to re reduce risk, but cannot yet guarantee prevention. And this is the point I'm going to speak to now. So, our ongoing work is very much based on bridging the gap between risk reduction and, and prevention. So, one of the things we discovered when we were doing pronuclear transfer and others who were also doing uh, spindle transfer um, uh, came to the realization that although we can get uh, produce blastocyst with very low carryover of mitochondrial DNA and the carryover originates from this carrier plus mitochondrial DNA um, that in about 20% of ES cell lines derived from those embryos that this tiny fraction of mitochondrial DNA takes over and if you like, outcompetes the mitochondrial DNA from the donor egg. So we, we don't yet know the causes of this. We've been doing some explorations and we don't know if it's just an ES cell thing, but one of the interesting observations we've made, and this here is in, in mouse zygotes, is that if we, if we tag uh, mitochondria with a, a, a GFP um, and then do a, transplant, do a transplantation from that egg, then we can track what's happening to the mitochondria in the reconstituted zygote. And what we see here is we see that there's uneven distribution in the zygote and we get enrichment in some cells in the, in the embryo. And if these cells uh, segregate to the epiblast, then we may end up with a sort of founder cell effect, which could, could give the carrioplast mitochondrial DNA a foothold. Um, so it could promote reversion and or an increase, increased heteros heteroplasmy in some, in some cell types. And indeed, it also cautions against the use of PGD to detect heteroplasmy levels in PNT embryos, because we may take a cell over here, but these ones are hiding here. So I think in order to tease out heteroplasmy in pronuclear transfer embryos, we need, really need to look at individual cells. So our work uh, in, for the last couple of years have been very much focused on how to minimize the contribution of carrioplast mitochondrial DNA. And one of, the, uh, one of the approaches we've been exploring is whether we can selectively eliminate this, 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 this fraction of mitochondrial DNA by targeting, targeting them for clearance by mitophagy. And so that, that, that concept was appealing to me, but we didn't know whether actually early embryos have the machinery to, 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 to um, support mitophagy. 
So uh, our work was very much um, assisted by the development of this MitoQC probe, which enables us to easily study mitophagy in living, in living embryos. And so the principle is simple. It's got, it's got an M-cherry EGFP fusion protein, and then we can target that either, either to the mitochondrial membrane or indeed to the matrix of the mitochondria. Um, and then when, when the, the, the mitochondria, if mitochondria are targeted to the lysosome, under the acidic conditions in the lysosome, we lose GFP fluorescence, but the M-cherry fluorescence persists for longer. So therefore the readout is that we can see red foci from this MitoQC probe. Um, so we've got Ian Ganley in Dundee, with whom we're collaborating, has developed a MitoQC mouse, and we took embryos from that, and we can see mitolysosomes appearing here from the late morula stage early and increasing to the blastocyst stage. But one of the problems with the mouse embryos is that the, the, the signal is very low before the morula stage. So we have, sorry. We've also injected MitoQC messenger RNA into the zygotes and then studied it through embryo development. And we can do this with, with a MitoQC probe that's targeted to the outer membrane. And here we see, see um, uh, mitophagy, the number of red foci that we can count increasing from the morula to the blastocyst stage. And similarly, if we do this with a, a, a MitoQC probe targeted to the matrix, um, we can see an increase, although the matrix uh, signal is, is uh, very subdued relative to the, to the uh, membrane-targeted mitochondria. So when we look at these uh, red foci, we find that they co-localize with the lysosomal, lysosomal protein LAMP1. So that gives us some confidence that we are looking at mitophagy here. And moreover, a prediction of the mitophagy is that we get a reduction in, in, in mitochondrial DNA copy number. And when we compare eight cell with the early blastocyst stage, we indeed do get a reduction in the, in the, in the copy number um, in, in the embryo. This is in mouse embryos. So we think we have uncovered here a developmentally regulated program of mitophagy and what might these mechanisms be. And in order to look at that, we went back to a large RNA-seq data set of human blastocysts generated by um, Friedrich Lanner's lab. And we found that this, uh, the expression level, the expression of the components of the BNIP3 NIX mitophagy pathway was consistent with what we were seeing. So just to look at this a bit, long, a bit uh, closer, NIX and BNIP3 are components of the outer uh, mitochondrial membrane. And under conditions of hypoxia, they are their recruitment increases and they're phosphorylated by a non-known kinase. And then this recruits components of the autophagosome. And then we get a phagophore and eventually fusion with the, with, with the lysosome. So we would therefore expect to see uh, increased co-localization of BNIP3 NICs with mitochondria as we progress through development. And we do, this is Nick staining here with co-staining with, with the mitochondrial protein TOM20. And you see that there's increased co-localization of, of, of NIX and TOM20, and similarly here for BNIP3. Um, and so if we, if we overexpress NIX in the embryo, we get a modest reduction in mitochondrial DNA no, uh, copy number. But if we do that with the phosphomimic, which is constitutively active, then we get a profound uh, reduction in mitochondrial DNA copy number. So we can induce this mitophagy using this, this phosphonix. And here's another example of this where Yuko has injected um, two, a two cell embryo, one with just the MitoQC probe and one, one with the MitoQC probe together with the PNEX and a membrane marker. And you can see here in the same embryo, there's very much an upregulation of mitophagy in, in response to overexpression of the phosphonix. Uh, we also, we've been doing work in human embryos, and we see that uh, the mitophagy, with a readout of the mitophagy uh, QC probe, we get an increase in, in, in red foci as we progress through development from the 
molecular to the late blastocyst. And then we can upregulate this by injecting Phoenix here in the, in, the, in the lower panel. So just to summarize, we have, uh, we think a developmentally regulated program of myto mitophagy mediated by BNIP3 mix, possibly among others, there are other pathways that we haven't investigated yet. Um, and we're currently looking at the consequences of this for inheritance and using a mouse model with carrying a mouse mutation, carrying a, a mitochondrial DNA mutation, we can see an increase in intracellular variation between the moila and blastocyst stage. And the question is whether that might be driven by, by mitophagy and hence has, may have implications for inheritance of mitochondrial DNA mutations. And of course, we're very interested in understanding whether this, this tool can be used to target carrier plus mitochondrial DNA for mitophagy. And I had hoped to uh, be able to present this, but I'm afraid COVID got in the way. Um, so we, we, we're still carrying, we hope to know pretty soon. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and to acknowledge our people in the lab and our many great collaborators and funders, and especially the people who organize the egg donation program. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.